Security Project. Welcome to our annual Christmas party. Uh, no, not really, but uh, this has been an exciting couple of weeks for us. If you're not familiar with the American Security Project, founded in 2006 by a few senators, uh, Hagel, Kerry, Hart, and Redmond, and Christine Todd Whitman, among others, uh, to have a bipartisan group that would take on topical issues that if brought up in the ordinary context were oftentimes uh, painted far left or far right. And we wanted to have a bipartisan group that could discuss, discuss these issues and hopefully uh, use a factual basis and discuss them from a national security perspective. So you can tell by those names, uh, we're expecting an exciting week or maybe two weeks here with two of my board members maybe headed over to the Pentagon and the foggy bottom. Uh, a quick couple of ground rules. I'll make some introductory remarks, and we'll have the Honorable Ellen Tauscher come up and speak for Ellen as long as you want. Um, then afterwards, we'll do a QA. and a I'll moderate the Q&A. When we do the Q&A, we'll just I'll pick on who's going to ask the question. Please tell us who you are and the state of question, and uh, don't read a treatise, and uh, we'll be good to go. And hopefully, everybody will have a good dialogue going on today's subject. Uh, I think most of you know Ellen Tauscher. <coughs> She just brings a wealth of experience to the national security issues, and we're, we're thrilled to have you here today. Of course, she was Under Secretary of State for Arms Control and International Security, uh, as well as, most lately, Special Envoy for Strategic Stability and Missile Defense. Of course, prior to that, 12 years in Congress, serving on the House of Armed Services Committee and Chairman of the Strategic Forces Subcommittee. Uh, first woman, I'm told, to be a member of the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, served as an officer of the American Stock Exchange. Uh, she has a deep understanding of the challenges that face our country and certainly has made significant contributions on national security issues, was instrumental in passing New START, uh, has, is very familiar with our relations with Russia and particularly U.S. missile defense policy. So Ellen, we're very anxious to hear your comments about missile defense, the status of U.S.-Russian strategic stability talks. Ladies and gentlemen, Ellen Tauscher. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, it's really it's great to be here. Uh, I'm happy that uh, that your founders are going to find you gainful employment in some good places. We do hope, we all hope, I think. Uh, I really want to acknowledge my friend and colleague Terry Lodge. Uh, two years ago, I was recovering from cancer surgery in the hospital, getting phone calls from Hillary Clinton, John Kerry other people, basically croaking onto the phone, make them vote, make them vote, make them vote. Because I knew we were ready to ratify the New START Treaty. And Terry's efforts were instrumental in our getting the kind of public awareness that a campaign put together to get the uh, 67 votes we needed. We actually got 71. For those of you uh, that like to follow new trends and getting people to be informed of things, we did a very uh, unusual thing for a treaty. We went out and actually sold it publicly. Uh, over the time that I was doing uh, chemotherapy and radiation, I couldn't leave the house, but I could talk to editors uh, on boards of uh, editorial boards around the country. And we went to purple, red, and blue states. Uh, we got 100% support. Some that didn't want to write for us didn't write, but those that did write did get 100% support, and the polling just before the uh, Thanksgiving holiday, when we were going to line up, showed that we had about 73% of the American people with us to ratify New START, and we got 71 votes. <coughs> so that's a message for the future, for other things that we might try to do, like CDPT and others. A big public campaign is important, informing people is important, but what's really important is providing political capital, positive political capital, for the Senate when they need to take a vote. So I'm here today to talk about my past, since I want to make very clear that I'm a private citizen. I'm not in government any longer. I left as strategic envoy on September 1st. I left as undersecretary in February. It was my great honor to have served President Obama and the country as undersecretary and to work so closely with Secretary Clinton and uh, our friends in the National Security Council, the Pentagon, the intelligence community, the so-called interagency. And it was great. It was a great honor. Of course, it was because that no, no good deed goes unpunished. Uh, for the previous uh, 12 and a half years, I had been a member of Congress. I was the first member of Congress from 
of the 10th Congressional District, which is the home of the two National Weapons Labs, Livermore and Sandia, to actually represent them on their committee of record, which is the Armed Services Committee. And I toiled for many years by myself, pretty much, on the Strategic Forces Subcommittee. Um, my dad started calling me Missile Girl about 1999. <laughs> my mother actually said, do you know about the nuclear weapons? I told her if I told her anymore, I'd have to kill her. <laughs> and uh, eventually, when we got struck by lightning in the 2006 election, I became chairman of Strategic Forces in January of 2007, where I was uh, happily sitting uh, when I was asked by the President and Secretary Clinton to become undersecretary. As you know, at that time, uh, the Bush administration was coming out of office. We had prepared nothing for the New START Treaty uh, negotiations. We had a treaty that was inconveniently expiring uh, the subsequent December 5th of 2009. Uh, so we had to scramble. Uh, the great news is we had Rose Gottemuller and a terrific team of very, very enterprising and experienced people in the State Department. All things treaty, all things arms control, all things not pro And a great team in the National <coughs> Security Council. And the president that really wanted to move forward uh, and not only reset the relationship with Russia, but use the negotiations of the New START Treaty to help accomplish that. And Terry and other people in the State Department worked in the interagency to make sure that once we got the treaty ratified, uh, once we got the treaty done, which we did after about my being in Geneva for 23 long days with only seven days of close, uh, we uh, actually got it done, uh, you know, early February, mid-February. In March, we announced it, and then we went to the Senate to get it ratified later that year. And it was unfortunate that we had to do it in a light duck. Uh, Senator Kerry and others had done a good job of getting a number of uh, hearings done. Uh, we also knew that we needed bipartisan support, clearly, because we needed 67 votes. But we were able to go forward and get it ratified, and it was just a terrific thing. That same day, um, as I was trying to recover from tough cancer surgery, Another one of my bills don't ask, not, don't tell not passed by the House. So I had an absolute double whammy that day of getting new start ratified and getting sent to the president, don't ask, don't tell. So it was a great day. Um, missile defense, strategic stability in Russia, all intertwined, all uh, things that I've worked on for many years, uh, starting when I was in the Congress and thoroughly when I was undersecretary and then as special envoy. Let me just say that there is a lot to be optimistic about. Uh, first of all, we had an election last month. It was settled for me, perhaps not for everyone. It was settled for most Americans that President Obama has another term. And that says that we have uh, the opportunity to move forward uh, on this relationship and to build a relationship that is sustaining, uh, strategic, and that is one that encompasses many, many different uh, challenges. Our relationship with Russia over many years has been one of, of cooperation on the first floor, fighting on the second floor, dealing with other issues including trade and many other things on the third floor, uh, dealing with uh, multinational issues on the fourth floor. It's one of those very dynamic, very large uh, P5 relationships that is fundamentally important. Uh, a little confession, when I called Hillary Clinton four years ago and tried to tell her how important it would be for her to Secretary of State, I made the mistake of telling her that it was all about Russia. Of course, it's not only about Russia, but in my opinion, it was all about Russia back then, because it was important to have Russia's support both on Iran, uh, on the turmoil in the Middle East, on energy policy, and about moving forward on many different issues, including arms control and non-proliferation. Uh, I think that turned out to be true. But now, as you can see, with the advent of President Putin, uh, we don't have the relationship we had even eight months ago. Uh, but I think we do have the opportunity to move forward. My particular position as Undersecretary was to be at my level, uh, working with both Ambassador Kislyak and Deputy uh, Foreign Minister Sergei Ryabkov. Uh, we developed a very strong relationship. I also worked with Anatoly Tanov, who had been in the Foreign Ministry to their version of the Pentagon soon after we uh, got the treaty ratified. So there's a number of very important players. These are really old hands. These are seasoned 
foreign policy diplomats. These are people that really understand the relationship. Uh, all of them have been posted here for many years. They have lots of relationships, including people on the Hill. So this is a sophisticated relationship and one that needs lots of understanding. But also, it's one where you cannot allow what's happening on the second floor interrupt what's happening on the fifth floor. So you need a broad relationship, lots of interlocutors, and people that can work issues in a way that builds trust and builds understanding. It's also important to hold very tightly to your talking points. Repeating yourself over and over again uh, can be boring for you, but it's very important for others. And I found myself uh, when I came in uh, as undersecretary and we were working on the phase adapted approach, I found myself repeating myself over and over and over again both about what EPA is and what it isn't. Nothing has changed, uh, except the fact that we have gotten all the agreements done in a record time. Frank Rose, who some of you know, worked for me in the House. He was a terrific staffer on missile defense uh, when I was, uh, when I was uh, chairman. And I brought him over with me. He's now in DAS, uh, working with Rose, and uh, he is a terrific negotiator. But when we announced the phase adapted approach in September 2009, it was very clear that we had to go out and get these four agreements done. And we had to deploy the radar on the president's timetable. Not an easy thing to do. We didn't do it. This past May, in uh, the Chicago NATO summit, uh, President Obama and uh, Secretary General Rasmussen announced uh, interim capability, which was basically turning over some of the assets, including the radar to um, the SAC York, who's also a UConn commander. And so we have a phase adapted approach that has all of its assets negotiated, all of its treaties done, all of its agreements done, and we're now waiting to phase in those different pieces. What we don't have is an agreement with Russia uh, to go forward, but it is something that has highly animated all of our friends in NATO. They all want it. Uh, and I think, frankly, some of the Russians do too. Uh, they have some concerns about the capabilities of the system in the later years. We've known that from the very beginning. We also have a lot of concern about what Iran is doing. So we not only want a Russia that is helping us by becoming cooperative and working with us and putting some of their assets and becoming interoperable with the system, but we also need a Russia that is helping us make sure that Iran gets neither a long-range missile that can carry a nuclear weapon or a nuclear weapon. And that is a long-term prospect that has been, I think, more successful, uh, but less, less transparent for people because it's all based on uh, these very intricate uh, sanctions that we have put in place, mostly with our E3 plus 3 partners. So I think that the situation we have right now is a wait-and-see situation. Uh, let, let, Last year, when President Putin came back into office, everything basically went into a holding mode. We went into our political campaign. Now we're both out of our political campaigns, and we can both begin to talk. And I think that's a fundamentally important opportunity for us. Uh, we've made some <coughs> things very, very clearly. We're not going to change either our deployment strategy, our timetable, or what we were deploying because of the Russians. On their part, they want more confidence and understanding as to what we're going to do in the later years. We want the help of the Iranians, and we want to be sure that Europe, which is a key ally to us, not only Europe at large, but for our NATO allies, but that Russia understands that we want them to be part of European security. Russia is a huge European player. We want them to turn and be part of European security. If you're going to be part of European security, then you have to understand that NATO allies have real growing concerns about what the Iranians are doing. Not only because we know what the Iranians are doing, but because we hear what the Iranians are saying. So if you want to be part of European security, then you have to share your colleagues and your neighbors and regional players' concerns about what the Iranians are doing and help us create a security umbrella in this kind of missile defense strategy that we put together. Unfortunately, for those people that didn't believe that missile defense was possible uh, or worth the investment, there's nothing better than what, what's happening in the Middle East right now to prove to them that missile defense does work. And that the kind of networking that we do, the, 
the, the, the regional networks that we put together, both for the sensors and for the operational missiles to deter and, and defend, is, is a tremendous <coughs> opportunity for people to get a friend and to find a way to create a missile defense strategy that works for them. The hardest thing would be for someone in the third row to shoot me straight in the face. That would be very difficult for me to defend. But Terry probably is the best person to defend me because she's sitting on the side and you can see the arc and the asthma. And that's why missile defense is really a networked system of sensors and, uh, and deployed assets where it's best to have friends that are working in cooperation with each other. Both the Middle East and the Far East are big opportunities to open up a worldwide network of missile defenses. That kind of cooperation breeds the kind of contentment and the kind of uh, transparency that gets people to feel that they actually know who you are and what you're doing. We believe in cooperative agreements. We believe those agreements that really put people uh, on notice that they're meant to protect somebody nearby really creates the kind of environment where people are less suspicious and less worried about what's going on. We think the Middle East is a perfect place for that. You, know, you all can think of a few countries that have better relationships with each other than they did even 10 years ago. And they are perfect examples of countries that can work together cooperatively on missile defense. Obviously, missile defense is both tiered and layered. Different assets apply for different reasons. And you know that NATO just had <coughs> patriots in Turkey point defense to protect against the situation that is uh, unfortunate situation that has developed in Syria. So I could go on about uh, more about the talks, my aspirations for more talks in arms control with the Russians, uh, my hopes that we work more cooperatively on cyber and many other things. Uh, I think that we have a very grand and very important relationship with the Russians that will come forward now that the political environment has settled down. I, I wish the president and his team all the luck in the world. I will be watching it from the side as a citizen, but one that is significantly interested. Uh, I do sit as vice chair of the Scowcroft Center at the Atlantic Council, so it's not like I've gotten completely away from it. And I also sit on the board of governors of both the Livermore National Laboratory and Los Alamos National Laboratory. So while I don't do national security every day, I do do it uh, as an advocation and as someone who wants to stay deeply involved and interested from the private sector. So I'm happy to answer any questions, Steve, that you might have or any questions that our friends have. And uh, once again, it's great to be here. I wish you all a happy holiday and a Merry Christmas. And uh, I'll answer any easy questions you have. Oh, well, thanks. <laughs> yeah, any easy ones. I'm going to take the privilege of asking the first question, if I may. And first, let me say thank you for your service, both in Congress and in state. Uh, not an easy job. And, Certainly, we appreciate you staying with the subject now. That, uh, you're obviously a subject matter expert, which ASB supports. Um, but you mentioned perhaps the future now that Putin's in place, the president's, our president's been reelected. Uh, there obviously, I think, a wonder of opportunity here uh, that they, if they start on it early, maybe we can make some progress with a number of issues, not the least of which might be perhaps a follow on to, to the new start. When you look at the fiscal cliff and the money we spend on nuclear weapons, maybe you know, a reduction lower than the 1550. So I'd be interested in your thoughts about that and what you think the uh, probability of making more progress with Russia is. Um, the Russians do not appear to be at all interested in a follow on to the New START agreement. They made that clear during the negotiations, um, which I think we all consider to be unfortunate. I think that you know, the bilateral channel between the United States and Russia on arms control. Um, is where all the action is, it really isn't anything else. I think many people want us to move to a multilateral approach to arms control, but I think we need at least one more round ourselves. But of course, the president isn't precluded, I'm not suggesting he would do this, but he's not precluded from doing unilateral reductions on his own. I don't perceive that would happen until the Iranian situation is settled, and I don't believe that would happen until later in his term uh, if we were not successful to get the Russians back. Um, part of what I worked on with the Russians is a term that I coined called mutually assured stability, which is the bridge between where we have been, mutually assured destruction, to what the future can look like. And it is the framework for a cooperative relationship where we clearly are uh, have, have, have more of a sense of trust, uh, more of a sense of uh, understanding where each other are strategically, 
what our regional issues are, um, where we are with Europe, what does that mean, and you know, has, has Russia moving toward a, a Euro European security environment where they are a uh, partner. And so, you know, I think that mutually assured stability is a worthwhile goal. I think it is a characterization of the relationship that is much more healthy uh, than it has in the past. Uh, but we have some elements that we have to achieve to get there. And, and one of them clearly is to understand how we're going to deal with missile defense and what the Russian role might be in a cooperative agreement and how they actually would play in that. Would they put security assets such as sensors because they're farther downrange, of course, closer to the Iranians, that would be very helpful. And how do they come into the shared command and control? And how would they do that in a way that at first would not be uh, would, would have two triggers, basically. Um, our missile defense system is so robust that we actually can write out things. If we, uh, you know, you can't, you can't be sitting with a glass of water and have somebody tap you on the shoulder and say, we just had a shot launched. And you're not going to be putting down your glass of water and kind of sit and think about what you might do. <laughs> These things are all pre-programmed. They're already war game. They've already been exercised. Everybody kind of knows because you've got minutes and seconds to make decisions. So it's pretty much decided. And so we need to have the kind of confidence with the Russians that we understand exactly how we're going to take what is our own system and deal with their assets, uh, have separate command and controls that sometime over the future, I, I believe, uh, probably in you know, 20, 20 years, can become one system when uh, there is a lot more confidence in the relationship and there's a lot more sense that we are uh, not dealing with dualities, but we are dealing with uh, a sense of European security in a very um, obvious and very agreed way. So I think it's important that we try to understand how to go forward. But you know, the political decisions have been made, so let's get it. Let's get people to the table. You bet. All right. Remember my rules on questions. Please state your name and uh, keep it short. Yes, ma'am. Um, on uh, missile defense negotiations. And, and your name, please. Russia. Rachel Oswald, Global Security Newswire. Um, could you discuss what you think the possibility is of uh, Obama, of the Obama administration sharing the velocity burnout data of the SM-3 interceptor? It had been previously reported that the Defense Department was considering this, but then um, political fervor in Congress kind of tamped that down. And then separately on that same line, the Pentagon announced there was delaying by up to nine months the um, development contract for the SM-3 Block 2B interceptor, which was the one the Russians really object to. Do you think it's possible um, in the in the missile defense cooperation discussions that the government administration might say we're just going to put that off for a while because Iran has not been assessed to be advancing at its long-range ballistic missile development in the new CRS report? I'm going to take them in reverse order. The reason the 2B was delayed is because the Senate took the money away. <clears throat> so, no money at all. So that's one problem. <coughs> and, you know, I'm not going to discuss what, what anybody's uh, strategy is for, for discussing things. What we've made very clear is um, that things that are classified remain classified in our conversations, um, even though I think that some people work overtime and think, like to think about things like secret deals. Um, we're all American patriots. We're not interested in doing things that are either against the law or are going to harm our country in any way. So there is no secrecy about the negotiations, and there's no plan on giving things to the Russians that they shouldn't have. So the Pentagon will make those decisions. Uh, but if something is uh, if something can be known to the Russians, then, then they're, they're, they're going to know about it. But uh, the whole issue of whether the SM3 is on track or not is really about congressional funding. And they cut it last year. And that's why it's been delayed. And uh, you know, I think that the uh, administration's intent is obvious, because uh, it's in the FIDA that, uh, that SM3 is meant to block to be is meant to go forward. All the way in the back. Wynne Sumpacker with the U.S. Health Safety Commission. You're going to have to speak really loud. <laughs> Wynne Sumpacker with the U.S. Health Safety Commission. Hi. Hello. I was wondering if you might have any insights as to what President Obama specifically was referring to when he offered President Putin more flexibility after the election. 
No, I'm not clairvoyant. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir, up front. Uh, Tom Kalino, Arms Control Association. Tom, so good to see you. So good to see you. Um, you mentioned that the Russians are not interested in the next round of arms reductions. Uh, part of that, not the only reason, uh, is because of their concerns about the European missile defense deployment. Um, they say. Sorry? They say. Yeah, they say. They say. Um, and knowing that you're not going to get into you know, future negotiations, but um, given your previous role as a venture, as you say, a private citizen now, um, what might you think would be a possible way to square the circle? So you've got Russia that needs to be to feel reassured about what the U.S. is doing. Uh, if the treaty ever gets done and gets back to the Senate, you need to make sure the public in the Senate that Obama has not given away the store on this defense. So how do you? How would you? How would you advise the president to thread that needle to reassure Russia and the Senate at the same time? Uh, and in that vein, I would just ask your thoughts on the National Academy of Science report from September, uh, which talked about um, not doing phase four of the EPAA and doing an East Coast <coughs> here in the U.S. Does that play at all into your thinking about what might be the issue? Thank you. Well, um, you know, I cannot predict what what the, the new environment will be, although I, I'm optimistic, as I said, um, uh, you know, on the policy side. Now that we have the political environment settled, President Putin, President Obama, um, you know, I think it's important uh, to allow the president, when he gets his new Secretary of Defense and his new Secretary of State, to be able to, perhaps in the State of the Union address, put forward uh, something that will um, create the framework for what his ambitions are for his second term. I know, I think we all know, that President Obama came in to office, uh, and certainly in his prog speech, was very animated uh, about um, nuclear weapons. He has spoken eloquently about the prospect of nuclear zero, but he has made it very clear that he does not believe it will happen either in his lifetime, and it will take patience and persistence. So he, he is someone who uh, made it very clear very early on, and used political capital to do so, that he, he wants to have a cooperative relationship with Russia, and he wants to have uh, a nuclear uh, arsenal that is both safe, reliable, uh, and, um, and certifiable, but one that is uh, not so large, not so expensive, and, and eventually he wants to get rid of nuclear weapons. So I think the question is, you know, what do we do to settle the issues that will cause the Russians to uh, come back to the table? Missile defense, I believe, is a part of their narrative, but I don't believe it is the totality. Um, the Russians, uh, I believe, and I think most people believe, are over-dependent on their nuclear forces because they have a less robust conventional force and other things. So their, their equation, where they put a lot of their their stock is frankly in their nuclear weapon capability. Uh, so there is a dovetail clearly with missile defense. And what does missile defense do uh, to degrade their capability? And we have asserted, and that's why sticking on talking points is important. We have said this consistently. There's nothing about our system, which is a limited system, which is targeted toward the Middle East, uh, which clearly uh, does not have any kind of robustness. It would only chase the tail of Russian ICBMs. You could put it on top of it, it would still only chase the tail. So where it's located, move it this way, do it that way, all of that is um, obfuscation. It does not solve the problem that we have, that our system is not robust enough to hold their nuclear arsenal at risk, period. So we keep saying it. Some of them believe us. Some of them can't believe us. And some of them won't believe us. I think the won't is a small part of it. I think that those that can't, can't for political reasons because they don't really want to come to the table and be in a place where they're going to go below 1515. We have seven years to get there and we're almost there now. So I think this is a question where we have done, I think, a good job of keeping our allies and others on, uh, with us. They, we, we don't have any dissension or question as to uh, what EPA is and what it does. Our, our NATO allies are enormously appreciative that we have deployed it so quickly and that they are protected, the southern tier is protected uh, from, from Iranian short and medium range. So 
I mean, that's all very, very good. So we don't have any question that what it is, and we keep asserting it. So what do you do to move things forward? It's a conversation between the two principals. And I think that, you know, we'll see when, um, after the confirmation hearings, when we get a new Secretary of Defense, a new Secretary of State, when the President is able to actually begin traveling internationally, and when he, he sits down with Mr. Putin for the first time, and when that conversation, it'll be part of a very big conversation about many other things, but it's clearly something that I believe the President will talk about in his first conversation. And I think that we can move forward uh, to do things that will build confidence, but at the same time, the decisions on deployment will be made going forward. We have made agreements with countries on, on the deployment strategy in both 15 and 18, and uh, we, we intend to keep those promises. Uh, and the whole question of where 2B will be ready will really be up to Congress. Are they going to provide the money for 2B to be actually um, not only built but tested? Because we've also made a commitment in EPAA not to deploy anything that hasn't been tested. We've already done that in Fort Greeley. So I hope that answers your question, Tom. Great answer. Yes, sir. Yes, Bill Jones from Executive Intelligence Review. Uh, if you could say something about what, what possibilities there are for moving forward on this missile defense issue because the, the Russian reaction, as you noted, uh, has been to uh, intensively modernize their nuclear system. They're you know, going fifth generation nuclear missiles. They're bringing back the, uh, the Satan uh, the liquid fuel rocket and modernizing this. And similar to what they did when uh, the SDI uh, was proposed by Reagan, instead of cooperation, they said we're going to overpower it with our nuclear missiles, and they're doing the same thing at this point. And I think that's probably is one of the reasons why they're not interested in coming into any kind of agreement at the present moment. But they are working on their own uh, ballistic missile defense system. Uh, although they've given up Barbala, they've moved to Border Nash, it's a more modern place. But what can we do concretely? Because we, we're, we're, prom we're telling the Russians what we're, what we're not going to do, and they're probably believing us, but any military planner who's looking at these, this equipment on the other side of the border knows other things can be put on top of it which could threaten them. And so that the promises sometimes are not enough, especially because we have to agree to it. The system cannot be made into an offensive system. That's a simple fact. Uh, and, you know, we keep saying it, and we hope that they'll get it, that they, you know, we've done things to prove it to them that is in the unclassified world, and, you know, it's been very clear that that's what we believe and that's what the, the, the allies believe. Um, you know, the question here is, this goes back to the question of mutual, uh, mutually assured stability. This is about changing the context of the relationship, changing the opportunity and the aspirations of the relationship. To not have this uh, tit for tat, um, you know, you, you build one, I build one faster, you know, one of those kind of relationships that we've frankly had for 60 plus years. And if we can change the relationship, I don't believe we can do it turning on a dime, but I think that we can use things fundamentally to do that. Uh, we did reset the relationship in a cooperative way with New Start. We are working, obviously, very cooperatively on a number of international issues, Iran, Iran and the sanctions most visibly. So there are a number of things that we're doing, but if we can, if we can talk to the Russians about changing the context of the relationship, moving from mutually assured destruction to mutually assured stability, Defining what that means, uh, there, there are probably a baker's dozen, 13, 14 things that we each have to work on uh, that are primary national security issues that are deliverables for anyone that has to be secure in the 21st century. And, and about half of those are things that we clearly can work on cooperatively in the next 20 years. That's a big deal. And let's figure out what they are and let's figure out how to prioritize them. Missile defense is one of them. Obviously, cyber is one of them. Trafficking, there are a number of other things that clearly, regional stability, there are a number of other things that we can work on. Uh, you know, I'm not there anymore, but my suggestion would be that we begin to articulate with the Russians what exactly mutually assured stability looks like, what exactly those elements are that we work on and we prioritize them. We begin to operationalize and, and deliver on them. And we get ourselves to a place where we make it clear to them that these, you know, the way that they do their nuclear stockpile management is vastly different than the way we do it. Part of what you're talking about is what they do. 
Obviously, they have amped up a couple of things. I'm not too sure that those things are more than rhetorical uh, claims that we're going to be doing this and we're going to be doing that. Um, but in the end, you can either spend your money on these things, on this arms war, on this arms race, which brings no one really, really anything, or we can move to mutually assured stability, where we begin to understand that we are not targeting each other. We are not in an arms race. We are not foes. We're not yet allies, but we're not foes. And move toward this mutually assured stability framework and try to find a way to work cooperatively on some things. You know, part of the problem, frankly, is very obvious. The Russian military, not unlike our own military, has a way that they've done business that they prefer. They like having the enemy they had yesterday. It's pretty easy to understand how to deal with them. And if you don't know how you're then going to go get your money, and you're then going to go get your budget, and you're not then going to go get your promotion, because the guy that you were actually tipped against is now no longer somebody that you're considering a foe, you might be a little insecure about your future. So there has to be a big conversation about what we do together, what it means for these stovepipes, what it means for people that are in the captain range right now in the Russian military, what it means for their promotion, for their security, how they're gonna go forward, and what cooperation really means. And I think that that's a conversation that President Obama and others um, in, in this administration can do very, very well. Yes, sir. Hello, Captain. David Kopp. Hey, uh, David. How are you? How are you? Yes. Friends Committee on National Legislation, you look very good. Thank you. Um, tactical weapons in Europe. So the U.S. has a small number of tactical weapons. And some Europeans say, well, we don't really want those anymore. And there's been discussions. In the first Obama term, some people say, well, maybe we should look at this again. So are those weapons going to be there forever? Are they still needed for uh, security? Is this something that Obama could be uh, pushing at the end of the second term? Yes, and we are, and, and I think you know that they are political weapons. Um, but of course, the further east you go in Europe, the more they want them because of their life experience. Um, you cannot, you know, as, a, as a recovering politician, I will tell you that you cannot tell people to deny their past. And if someone has attacked you, made you insecure, killed your friends and family, and they're still just across the border, you're not going to, um, I think ever, feel like you can turn your back on them. And so, you know, the further east you go, the former Warsaw Pact countries, of course, as, as much as the Western European countries say, we'll get rid of them, the guys on the eastern side say, I'll take them. So this is a political negotiation. It's an important one. Uh, it, it is two parties. What, you know, what do we do with our few? And what do they do with their many? And how do we move theirs closer to Moscow? Uh, and, uh, you know, get them turned off in a way that makes us all confident. So I think that that's... I know that's where the administration would like to go. It is a um, tripartite conversation. It is between our NATO allies and our European allies and the Russians and the United States. Um, once again, that's a priority for the administration. Once we get uh, the new team in, and I think that that is uh, you know, something that we've talked to them about while we were negotiating New START. It's obviously a part of, it's not the next up, but it is it is the next up in the sense that it is something else we have to do. Uh, but of course, we want to do uh, longer range arms control between bilaterally between Russia and the United States. But, but Alan, when you see the deterioration of Russian's conventional forces, they've got an over reliance, I think, on the tactical nuke side. Got it, Steve. So, that's right. not very willing to give them that's, But that's why cooperation, redefining relationships, making sure that the old battle plan is not the same battle plan that you're looking at now. Catherine Keller of uh, the University of Maryland. Hi, Catherine. Um, I, I'd like to pick up if I can, Madam Secretary, your last comment and talk about the problems of trying to find a framework in which to have this conversation. As you know very, very well, the Russians would prefer to fly that way. And they'll, by the way, drop by and you know, tell the Allies on the way home. But we certainly have remained, and I think in your time, actually had negotiations and discussions of three or four or maybe different places, yes. and there is a tension there, and the question is, how do you resolve it? The NATO-Russia Council uh, perhaps is more interested because Mr. Rosen is there, but not necessarily more effective. So what do we do now? Do we stay with, with the tripartite uh, 
sort of maximum venues so that the allies in a sense they're included? Or is this sort of approach so much different that they'll have to be bilateral? You know, I, I actually don't know, Catherine. I think we have to see what Mr. Putin's approach will be. But I certainly think that um, we, we, we mixed up the venues for lots of reasons, including the back and forth ping pong ball between Moscow and, and Russia. Moscow and, and Washington um, gets to be a little dry, and there's other, other business you have to do. Um, my counterpart and I met, you know, probably not every week, but very, very often. Wherever we were, we met everywhere. He would be someplace, I would be someplace, we'd find someplace in between, or I'd come there, he'd come there. We did a lot of Russia, you know, Moscow, uh, Washington trips, but um, we met on the margins of the Munich Security Conference, we met in Brussels a lot of times, we met in London, we met in different places, St. Petersburg, just because we were meeting so often that it was, you know, too far to go to Moscow if he's traveling too. So the, the question is, what is Mr. Putin's posture going to be? That is a principals meeting that, that the president and uh, and the president have to have, and um, I think we have to see. But I think from our side, we're not confused at all. We have a very robust agenda. We have a number of things we want to do. Of course, I think we would like to ratify the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. So there's a number of, of things that are on us that are both things we have to do, things that we have to do with them. But you know. We are very cognizant of our European and NATO ally concerns. Uh, all trips to Europe go through London, Paris, and Brussels constantly because we want to keep everybody apprised. We do a lot of ETCs now, which is great. Uh, so there's, you know, we, we're keeping everybody apprised of what's going on. So I think we have to see what Mr. What Mr. Putin's ambitions are, um, and what his tolerances are. And I think that um, from our side, I think that president uh, who has met him but not worked with him most recently will be working with him in a way that is uh, to shape this opportunity to get some of this business done and to move forward on what I think is a very robust agenda in the second term. Yes, sir. Join here with some little friends. Um, you, hey, talked Tom. Little, you, know, you talked earlier about that you, you are almost you're keying yourself to the Russians and what and as well as Frank Cruz has been doing as well. What would, what would, given how, given the, the, the scope of the development of the EPAA and the fact that within the next four years, it's not going to move that much, even, even if the Senate and House just fully funded it, it ain't going to be that much further down the road compared to what, where, where the Russians are really worried about, so further beyond that. How optimistic are you that, the, that Russia would, that Putin and Russia would, in fact, Change, would basically change their mind, and if they did, what would for the years, what would what would be the worry for them to say like, wait a minute, they they they, had, they stopped repeating themselves, they've gone to say something slightly different. Well, there have there have been there has been movement, and and some of it was <coughs> personal. Some of it also was in the press, um, but I think the key here is there are two there are two animating pieces of this. One is, what are we doing? What are our allies doing? What have we said we're going to do? What does the system look like? And what do the Russians believe it is? And they have been consistent. They, they say they believe in the out years that 2B is concerning to them. That's one piece of it. There's this other very big dynamic. It's the threat. It would be awfully nice if the threat was mitigated. The threat gets mitigated, lots of things can change. We're going to make our deployments, we've said that. But, you know, I'm not too sure whether 2B would go to Europe or not. But I bet, you're, I bet if the Iranians are still busily being bad, 2B will be in Europe. But, you know, if all of a sudden things change and no long-term, long-range rocket, no, no nuclear weapon out of Iran, that changes things. The president always said that the system was adaptive and phased about the threat. So we've made this point to the Russians, too. You know, you're worried about something that may happen in 2022. Um, I'm 
worried about something that's going to happen in 20 or 22 minutes. What are you going to do to help us with the Iranian threat? And I, Tom, I didn't answer your question about you know, whether we would put something on the east coast of the United States. That was raised when I was chairman. You know, I, I believe that is as redundant as the 10 ground-based interceptors were in Poland. Um, we have a very robust system that protects us currently, both in Fort Greeley and in Annenberg. And so the question of putting something up there is, is a feel-good measure. I'm not suggesting that we wouldn't do it or shouldn't do it. I don't think we'd have to. Uh, and it doesn't replace what we're going to have in Europe. Yes, sir, all the way in the back. Red Teal Arms Control Association. Hi. Um, in, uh, this is a phase four question again. Uh, you had mentioned in your initial uh, comments about we're not going to change our timetable because of the Russians. And oftentimes, listening to the administration, they, they basically say or imply that nothing will change our timetable. But what you just said, I think, is true to the spirit of the adaptive part of the right. space adaptive approach. That's right. And I guess what I'm curious is why do we not emphasize that more? You didn't mention that in your initial remarks. It's usually not mentioned in the administration. Iran can change the timetable, can they not? That's right. And if they continue to do what they're doing now, which That's is right. not developing longer range missiles, not flight right. testing IRBMs, ICBMs, why don't we emphasize that? And wouldn't that help us in our dialogue with the Russians if we, we, if we emphasize that more? We do, but we don't want everybody to know everything we're doing. <laughs> no, I mean, look, you, you, don't, you don't put everything out there, and you don't put everything out there in a way that it gets picked apart by people that are also conspiracy theorists that think that there are secret deals every five minutes. And the truth of the matter is, it's obvious. If the president made it very clear when he announced the phase adapted approach that we were changing what had been a Bush administration, uh, 10, 10 grounded based interceptors and a radar in the Czech Republic, which I had taken the money from in 2007 and 8, so it wasn't happening. But that was the plan. To this thing that we had proposed in the House, we called it tiered and layered. Now it's called phased and adaptive. But it's the same thing, and it's based on the, where we had put our investments from 2005, which was in the SM3 rocket, which is a 25-year-old Navy rocket, which is amazingly robust. So we turned it around in the Congress, and then you know when, when the administration came in, they picked it up and said, "Oh, this is what we're going to do." Plus, you know, we're going to deploy faster. So we did a number of things differently than the, than, than the Bush administration had. You know, it, the whole idea of of the ten ground-based interceptors in Poland and the Czech radar was deeply troubling to the Russians. The radar looked right in their bedroom window, and. I'm not suggesting that you do things because of the Russians, but I don't think you have to stab them in the eye. And it didn't protect anybody. It didn't protect anybody in Europe, and it didn't protect us, in my opinion, because it wasn't going to be deployed soon enough. So we went to put this Aegis system in. So we deployed the Aegis system immediately uh, back in the spring of 2009. And so we started to move very fast, and we made the negotiations happen to, with uh, Romania. <laughs> Uh, Poland and Turkey, and we got those done in 14 months. So the system as it is, is arrayed against a threat coming from the Middle East, and one that is short, medium range, and that could become a longer range system, and that is what 2B is about, and that gets deployed should there be a, a rising threat. And that's what we've said. We've said that consistently. But you know, when you get in the business of saying what you're not going to be doing in response to something and that's in a negotiation and that gets out in the public, people start to say, well, you know, you really should be doing that. And so I think that we've made it very clear to the Russians in our in our face-to-face -face conversations, you know, we are clearly going to deploy uh, in Romania because that is uh, a system that they have should have absolutely no concern about whatsoever. What happens in, you know, the, the date is 18. The Congress has now made 18 pretty much impossible for 2B. So what is it, 20, 22? I don't know. But whatever that long-range deployment is, whatever that Polish deployment is for 2B, that's about the threat. And if there is a long-range Iranian missile and they have a nuclear weapon, yes, it will be deployed. I don't, I don't know what the president at that time would decide to do if that threat had been mitigated. But, you know, 
we, we have a very tightly wound script. We repeat it over and over again, but the Russians understand uh, that there are two ways for them to be cooperative. One is to become a regional partner in the EPAA, share sensors and, and work with us and, and gain trust and have confidence building measures and go forward, become a regional player, help with European security, moving forward to mutually assured stability. The other thing is, get rid of the threat. That solves a lot of problems. Yes, sir. Pat Hose from Defense Daily. Uh, Ellen, you said that uh, the, the Far East is a good opportunity to open up cooperative uh, missile defense, correct? We have a billion dollar deal, as you know, a long term deal that for Aegis that we've developed with the Japanese for a very long time. So, uh, you know, that is part of what we're doing, but there's uh, obviously other countries. Right. Um, well, I was going to say uh, Northeast or Southeast, Northeast is where it is. Um, was your perspective uh, impacted by the uh, moderately successful North Korea launch last week? Um, you know, I, I mean, I think, I don't know what moderately successful is. I, it's a failure as far as I'm concerned. Um, you know, I think you have to be informed by what happens, and I think you have to be aware that even with the change of regime, the North Koreans seem to have a very disturbing way of celebrating anniversaries and birthdays. <laughs> so, um, you know, look, you have, to, you have to keep your options open and you have to be aware that um, there has to not only be confidence in the system, which I think we've achieved most recently with the unfortunate events in the Middle East, because obviously our other cooperative relationship is with Israel on both uh, David Sling and, uh, and you know, Iron Dome and Arrow, which are amazingly successful. Uh, people that have, you know, castigated, mostly from my party, by the way, uh, you know, castigated missile defense is an impossibility, it'll never work, it'll never work. Well, I think the people of, of the Middle East uh, feel a little bit better about it. I don't think 80 to 85 to 90 percent is, is, is at the perfection people are looking for, but it's certainly better than it didn't work. Yes, sir. You're going to have to repeat the question. Um, Kenny's asking about the defense uh, authorization bill, the House and Senate language on reform of the NNSA. Um, I have a 21-year-old daughter, but I'm also the mother of the NNSA, I'm told. The problem, the problem is there are two fathers to the NNSA, Matt Thornberry and Pete Devenichu. Um Don't even think about it. <laughs> um, tough birthing process, I'll tell you. Um, you know, the administration, Bill Richardson was secretary, DOE fought us, the White House didn't really fight us, uh, but in the end we got not what we wanted. Um, then we wanted what I think we should have now, which is a, um, I, I'd be leaning more toward an autonomous agency that reported to the secretary that was less encumbered by uh, the bureaucracy of DOE. Uh, you know, back then we were worried about a kudzu lazy bureaucracy that had the nuclear weapons. I mean, you know, nuclear, the, the energy secretary gets picked and they find out that they have control of regulating refrigerator coolant and the nuclear weapons. Is your brain pan that big? <laughs> and they usually decide that the nuclear weapons go to somebody else. So there's, you know, and there's always an energy crisis. And so the, 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 the good person that's the energy secretary is subsumed by something over there. And over time, down, 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 had gone the nuclear weapons complex into this cudulated bureaucracy at assistant secretary level that was struggling. And you know, big issues, lots of money, lots of things to do, uh, real life certifications, and uh, you know, real issues to manage. And a Congress that doesn't necessarily want to have to know a lot about it. And an advocacy question that never has gotten fixed. So, you know, I I, I support what the what the uh, 
what the bill says. I don't necessarily support all of the language in it or the ambitions toward it. Um, I've, I think none of us should be for an NSA that goes to the Pentagon. Remember civilian control, the nuclear weapons complex? So I think that you know, an autonomous agency, um, you know, kind of like NASA, kind of like SEC, but reporting directly to the secretary, um, and, and you know, with with understanding that this is so important that the president has to be involved at times, and you know, maybe you know, with a director that is uh, somebody that with a real pedigree that gets appointed, you know, like the FBI director for you know, ten years, so that there's not this question of in and out, up and down. Great answer. We can take one more, all the way in the back. Uh, my name is Li Bing. Uh, I'm from a Carnegie Endowment for International Peace at Tsinghua University, uh, Beijing, China. I'm sorry, sir, I can't hear you. Perhaps if you come a little closer. Yeah, okay, I can't speak a lot. Uh, my name is Li Bing. I'm from Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. And, Good work. And the Tsinghua University, Beijing, China. Uh, I'd like to hear your comment on uh, the, the U.S. Uh, policy on strategic stability and the missile defense uh, on, uh, with China. Uh, I, I especially like to know what is the difference uh, between the U.S. Uh, policy on China and on Russia on, on the same issue. Thank you. Um, I would say that it is, we want more. Uh, we want more transparency from China. We want more dialogue from China. We want more uh, bilateral engagement from China. Uh, we want to have a better sense for their ambitions, for their stockpile. Um, is this the right size? Is it meant to be, you know, is this a little like Goldilocks and the Three Bears? Is it a, you know, a little bigger? Is it a little smaller? Um, and when do they plan on becoming engaged in what, will, what I think is already a global effort uh, to have confidence in how the stockpiles are managed, uh, how they are um, certified, uh, and um, you know what what you know real reporting on size. So I think that we would just like more. Uh, we have because of the many many different relationships that we have had and agreements we've had with the Russians for for many decades, we have a very, very significant level of understanding as to the characteristic size uh, and the workings of their stockpile. <coughs> we do not have that with China. Well, I'd like to thank the audience for the great dialogue, and I thought some really thoughtful and great questions, and I appreciate you following my rules. Um, Ellen, we kind of wish that we were still back at Foggy Bottom, but... Uh, yeah, we yeah. Will, we will, we will, no doubt. This is a, a big topic for ASP. If you please hit our website, uh, follow us on Twitter. We're very active. We have a number of reports in the back. You're welcome to take. Uh, we're not going to let this issue go, that's for sure. Uh, the new administration, the elected administration. So, uh, again, we can thank them. Well, thank you.